Hi, I'm Doug Ross, editorial page editor at The Times. We're here with Chris Ratson, Julie Altoff, uh, both of them Republican candidates for state representative in District 19. Um, we should talk about, you know, the basic question first. Why are you running, uh, Chris? Well, I've watched this area just stagnate as far as wages go. As the middle class families are really suffering. I realize that the uh, current representative and Indeed, a lot of the representation we're getting here just doesn't have the solutions that are going to bring the wages up and help the middle class households here uh, thrive once again. And this area was once once one of the most prosperous areas in the entire country, and now I think it can. There's no reason it can't be that way again. Okay, Julie. Um, well, I was on the plan commission for 10 years in Maryville and on and off the BZA, and I really like public service. So I hope to bring um, fresh ideas and a fresh look to um, the problems and issues of this area. I like helping people. So from genuine concern, I want to see if I can make a difference. Okay. Um, why don't we talk about, uh, you know, what would happen if you're elected? Day one, what would be the first legislation you'd want to file? Julie? Day one, the first legislation um, would, I think, look at jobs. Um, when you apply for a state building permit, it could take up to 11, 12 weeks to make that happen. So I really want to look at what is bottlenecking the system. And I kind of hesitated because that might not be a legislative. That just might be walking down the hall to somebody's office and saying, do you need more help? Let's see what we can do to get that. So then to say, let's stick this in the budget. But that would be the first place I would go to is um, moving jobs as fast as we can. Okay. Chris? Well, I think my first day in office, it wouldn't be as much a legislative effort as it would a uh, social one. I would like to meet all of the representatives from the region and ask them if they would all like to get together for dinner so that we can discuss making a region caucus because I really believe that the interests of the region have to start coming before party. Okay. Um, we should talk about the uh, issue that was really divisive this year. This year was the uh, marriage uh, amendment. Where do you stand? My stance on issues like this is that you can't step on the rights of either side. I would not support any bill that's going to just antagonize one side and make this come back again the next year. I mean, this has just been going on for year after year. And like I said, I won't support any bill that's going to just make one side feel like they've had their rights trampled on and they're going to come back the next year and want to do it again and stop us from making any economic progress, which is what we really need to get done here. So you'd oppose the amendment? As written, yes. Okay. Julie? I would have liked to see the people vote on it. So um, personally, I think I would take a stand that marriage is between a man and a woman very traditionally. But that doesn't mean I'm not open to other ideas or civil um, unity. But why is it that we can't let the people vote? It's so held between this side and that side fighting. So I guess I'm a little open to government being turned back into the hands of the people. Okay, so you'd vote on it as it is currently written then? Yeah, they changed it so it's pretty... It's not as hardline as it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, your, your jobs agenda. What do you do to create the jobs? Well, I think that connectivity to Chicago is the biggest key. We need to bring more money into the community. The local jobs depend on us bringing more money into our community. Uh, the South Shore expansion that they're proposing, you know, if this does happen, and it's not going to bring jobs to Crown Point and into Hobart and to District 19 for at least 10 to 15 years. That's far too long. I've been working on a bus plan along with some of the other local officials here to try and bring at almost no cost to taxpayers uh, buses that will copying Valpo's system to bring uh, commuter buses to various points in District 19 so that commuters can go bring bring the bacon home from Chicago and support our local economy and get the wages moving locally in the right direction again. So we had that with the EasyGo system that collapsed under the regional bus authority. Yeah, they put those buses over, you know, these were all along 41 over here, in this district over here. They didn't come over to Crown Point. 
one of the obstacles they had for getting people in District 19 to use those is it takes just as long during rush hour to drive over to you know, the Dyer area as it does to drive up to East Chicago or Gary Station. So okay. I say if I'm driving half an hour, I might as well drive the other half hour and just drive all the way into Chicago. Okay, Julie? Um, just to tie in on the transportation part of what we're talking about, I'm really for stronger public transportation and the South Shore Line and better access to busing. But um, that, I don't believe the district was for it. Definitely the Lake County Council didn't vote to match taxes. So it's how to find the money to support that um, was a big issue there. And they fought as hard as they could to get those buses to stay supported with the RBA. Um, and then as far as jobs, I think I mentioned that already with, I really want to take a look at what is impeding growth in this area and growth in Lake County. Um, recently, the Crossroads Chamber and the Lakeshore Chamber initiated the Lake County Economic Alliance, the LCEA, and I was part of that as one of the founding board members with it. So there's a lot of good work that's happening there, one of which is a database that's going to hold all the available properties in Lake County so that when somebody calls in from either a trade show or just a search or um, our anti-Illinois campaign, that they can really look at a database and see um, how, where, what's available, where it is. It's really an exciting initiative that's happening. Um, and then again, once they get the property, let's get them the building permit quickly. Let's kind of fast track anything we can to get it, get it to happen. Okay. Um, we're, uh, uh, one of the things that happened in the legislature this year for education was the uh, uh, pre-K program. Now we don't know, you know which five counties that will be in yet. Uh, we know it's you know, just a very, very small pilot program. Going forward now, uh, uh, the next session is when we uh, draft the budget. What do you think about pre-K going forward? Uh, Julie? I'm all for it. We've got to educate our kids as young as we can, and they have the mental capacity. There's so much research about development of our kids and how fast their brains fire, and the quicker we can get um, more reading, more learning, more good habits built between um, our pre-K, and I'd like to have it involve parents too, like Parents as Teachers goes out to train parents on how to read to their kids, how to play with them, how to talk to them, and teach them about their environment so that they're one step ahead. So I think it's exciting. Um, I'm all for better education, more education, younger education. Okay. Um, Chris? Um, I actually agree on this. I, I like the program the way it's written too, where it's initially targeted towards lower income families. I think a lot of these families could really benefit from this program for getting a head start and getting a, someone that could help them learn reading and you know early math skills at an early age before they show up you know at kindergarten or the first grade already behind. Okay. Um, Robert Blatzkowitz, uh, Assistant Managing Editor, we should have introduced you from the start. Uh, jump in. Uh, sure. St staying on the topic of education. Uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, debates this, this past legislative session was over common core and education standards. Uh, where do you think that uh, the state should go with its, its standards and, and, and teacher evaluation and all those kinds of things? Uh, Chris. I have a number of close friends that are teachers and I hear from them a lot that there's a lot of concerns about the, the reforms that we've done. But at the same time, these reforms have gotten us national attention for you know a step being a step in the right direction. So I think that there's a lot of concerns that need to be addressed. Uh, they don't like the uh, arbitrary nature of the evaluation system. I mean, that's a legitimate concern. Uh, the voucher system overall is good. I mean, I think this is social justice at its best. You're taking kids that are part of a school that you know where they might not be an environment where they could choose to thrive and you say well if you are smart enough then we will there's you know like Mitch Daniel said your zip code shouldn't determine how far you can go in life I think that's a great thing but at the same time there's a lot of concerns that these teachers have brought up that need to be addressed you need to not dismiss what they're saying 
Julie? Yeah, I think Common Core Plus is headed in the right direction. Uh, I've been told it gives more flexibility to the teachers. Anything we can do to be one step ahead of the other states is a great thing. If we can have an educated workforce, then we can bring the jobs in because the businesses look for uh, quality workforce is probably number one, two up there. Um, and I understand today they're looking at the details. So the Board of Education, I would hope we could trust them and their expertise in the matter to work out all the details that still need to be done. There's a lot of confusion on what what is it exactly. And I don't know if how many people really know exactly what is all in there. And then if you did, well, it changes tomorrow. So we've got to wait for it to shake out to really decide. Okay, uh, we started to talk about uh, vouchers and, and charter schools, uh, uh, you know, all of that thing. Now, you know, some of the things we're finding is that, uh, you know, let's take charter schools. Uh, the uh, evaluations are showing that charter schools aren't performing um, any better than uh, the traditional public schools in a great many cases. Uh, you know, what do you think? Um charter schools, I'd, I'd like to see them still have the ability to be creative. Special parochial schools, I think, are a great thing. But they should have some standards that they have to abide by. If states are to regulate, um, you know, the standards and we got to make sure our kids are up to a certain level, let's make sure that that's happening. Um, it's, I don't see why they can't have some of that. And I don't mean that we have to come in with a hard hand. They can still have um, freedom of some of the things they want to put into their curriculum, but let's make sure the basics are being taught. Okay. Chris? I think that's one of the beautiful things about the voucher program and any privatization program is you can fire them. The parents don't have to put their kids in the private schools. If these private schools are not performing better, the parents don't have to put their kids there, and that's the most brilliant thing about it, I think. Okay. Um, Staying, uh, moving, moving from, from talking about vouchers to, to school funding overall, uh, we've seen a number of local school districts in Northwest Indiana uh, hold referendums seeking more funds just to operate. Uh, and, and speaking to the inadequacy of the current funding system uh, from the state. Where do you see that, uh, the state's role in funding the public schools and, uh, and what can be done uh, for these schools that are, that are having to lay off teachers, having to cut programs and such? Julie? Um, well, one of the schools you're talking about is Crown Point that, you know, the community voted to um, really shore up their schools. Um, other school systems I believe that you're talking about are more in um, underprivileged areas and they really struggle because the tax base isn't there to fund the school itself. So I think that some state support of that would be in line. But I, but I say that with caution because I would really want to make sure that the money is going where it needs to go. Chris? Yeah, I've always been a little bit skeptical of the system that's been put in place over the past years with the referendums and so on. I mean, on one hand, it's very good, you know, if a community wants to have a good school, then certainly there's nothing should get in their way. But um, like, like Julie said, the, uh, the underprivileged schools, if the tax base is not there, or the local interest in education is not there, where does this leave the students, you know, that the significant number of students at these schools that really want to work hard and want to try to succeed, you know, if their community doesn't want to spend on their education. I definitely think that that's a fair point, that the system is definitely broke. We, of course, saw that with Hebron, which had the referendum, doesn't have the tax base, uh, and so the referendum failed in uh, uh, 2012, as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, we should uh, um, go on to uh, a question about uh, um, what's your budget priority? I mean, you know, what's your number one priority for Northwest Indiana in the budget? I think my number one priority is infrastructure. What we have is crumbling and what we have is insufficient. I think that's our biggest unspoken of deficit is our deficit in infrastructure. 
I'm a business consultant, you know, by trade, and I've traveled all over the country, worked with all sorts of companies, and I've tried to ask them, you know, you know, maybe for personal reasons a bit, I say, why don't you open a branch office or move your headquarters down to Northwest Indiana? I mean, it'd be great for me. I wouldn't have to, you know, commute as much anymore. And the answer I get from a lot of them is usually, well, I would, I like the taxes there, but I would consider other suburbs of Chicago, but not Northwest Indiana. I said, really, why would you go to the other suburbs when they're in Illinois? And they said, well, because they're well connected to all the workers of Chicago in the other suburbs, whereas Northwest Indiana, you have to have a car to get there. Okay. I agree with the transportation piece, and I was happy to see that uh, Governor Pence signed into legislation all the money that they hope to throw. Isn't it twenty million? I think over a couple, over a few years with that, so it'll create jobs and really help our roads. Um, and I had a good point there. Let me think. Man, <laughs> I lost it. Um, great while well, you're taping, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, and they usually have. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. So, um, um, you know, we can move on, uh, you know, on the subject of transportation. Oh, I remember the point. Thank you. Um, when I think of the state of Indiana and how much Northwest Indiana puts down there, I want to be a voice to bring some of that money back. So when they pass transportation bills, how much of the roads are Northwest Indiana and how much of the roads are, you know, farther south? Not that I don't think they should have a piece of it, but can we have more of a piece of it maybe? Or really fight for our share if we're not getting it. So looking at the detail for our share. Okay. Um. And I guess conversely, would you fight for uh, uh, toll bridges in uh, central Indiana? I, I just, you know, I, I agree there needs to be another east-west, like speaking of the Eliana Expressway. But when it's at $6, $8 for somebody to ride it, it defeats the purpose. So I have a real hard time. So how do you balance who's going to pay for it with, you know, $8? It's going to be like the toll road. You only take it when you're um, tight on time or the weather's bad or there's an accident so you know you, you get more when the price is lower and I don't know how much we say we would have in that if it's privatization okay Chris I'm for more downstate toll roads I mean I didn't have any problem with them making the you know the, this our road up here in India toll road but yeah. why why is the rest of the state you know getting free roads that are paid for by us ah, exactly Okay, Robert? Yeah, uh, real quickly, if you could uh, talk about uh, gaming, uh, one of the issues that didn't really come up this session, but it's something that has come up, is the, uh, the thought that uh, to bolster uh, gaming in Northwest Indiana and casino revenues, uh, bringing land-based gaming uh, to Gary. Uh, your thoughts on that? I don't have a problem with it. The um, boats... <coughs> don't go anywhere so what really is the difference you know when it comes right down to it Chris yeah I mean if you've ever gone up there and seen the boats I mean they're they're essentially stationary pieces of property with water splashed around them I mean what's the difference of having a land-based one however I don't think that these casinos are going to be the answer to our problems I mean, if they were making you know fistfuls of cash guess what's going to happen and you see is happening is right across the border in Michigan and Illinois they're trying to get a piece of that, so it's just going to whittle away our money we're making from that. And um, how do you, we're, we're looking at um, um, giving tax breaks to, to, you know, for personal property, for instance, uh, you know. Um, on the business side. On the, on the business side. Uh, you're looking at uh, a decline in, or at least potential decline in casino revenue. How do you accomplish your spending um, uh, when you still have uh, uh, these revenue declines to address? I actually have uh, been very skeptical of this plan to cut out this. Whereas, but as much as I'd love to cut out a tax entirely, what I don't like is when you cut out a tax for some but not for others. You pick winners and losers. And that's a lot of what they're doing right now. They're saying that, the, well, well, we'll exempt some of the small companies but not the mid-sized companies. We'll exempt the new companies but not the old companies. And, you know, my biggest concern is that if you want to get rid of this tax to try and bring business in here, who's going to pay the difference? And it sounds like they're just going to shift the burden once again onto the residents. 
I mean, you don't want to drive away all the white collar jobs just to try and learn a few more factories. Okay. Julie? Uh, I don't like that they passed it when Lake County just got hit with our income tax, and now uh, here comes the relief of for businesses, but there was no plan to replace the money. So their plan was, okay, well, every county can make it an option. All right, then every county, except for Lake County, might be in a better position to offer a company coming in an abatement or, you know, the, the tax um, relief there. So it puts Lake County in a disadvantage at this time. Hopefully over time that'll work itself out, but this year, I don't know, it's I, di I didn't like it. I like the idea, but I didn't like all the detail that was put with it. Okay. One of the other things we've talked about in Northwest Indiana for years has been uh, a trauma uh, center. So the question is, how do you pay for it, and how do you how do you manage it? Because they're hugely expensive to have, you know, specialists on call twenty four hours a day. Yeah, I'm working in healthcare as one of the main industries I work in consulting. Uh, this is actually a really interesting question for me. Uh, it seems like the people that are going to you know, pay for it are going to be mostly located in South County, so they're going to want access to it. But on the other hand, the logical place to put it is where you have the large number of traffic as well as all the gunshot wounds, which is what the trauma center usually de deals with most is gunshots and you know, trauma from car accidents. And that's going to be up in North County, you know, up near Gary, perhaps near the IUN exit. Um, as far as funding it goes, you know, that's a good question. Um, I definitely think that the state should be helping us out with that a little bit. I guess, like Julie said, we spend we send a lot of money down there, and we definitely should be getting something back here. This is the sort of thing that can bring you know high tech jobs into our state if we have, especially if we have a research hospital attached to that. Okay, Julie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with Chris, and then piggybacking on that. It's a beautiful thing to tie it to Indiana University Northwest and to help shore up their medical program. And then not to mention Purdue right down the street. So it's, I think it's a beautiful um, project and it'll bring jobs. It'll um, revitalize that corner. It's a great spot on um, 8094 right there on Broadway. I'm an IUN alumni, <laughs> so it's a, it's a great thing. Okay. Uh, Robert, unless you have any other questions, I think we uh, have to jump to our final question in the interest of time. Uh, what did we not ask that we should have asked? Julie? Well, how about, um, well, I, I just think of my whole campaign is tied upon I want to listen to people. My slogan is open ears, open doors. I want to bring a fresh engagement piece. I want to hold um, public forums where we can talk and dialogue and hear from the constituents, I think that's something that's sorely needed. Uh, I don't believe there's been any public forums from a state rep in eight years. I tried to search it up and find it. I could not find one. So if we're going to have an engaged um, public, educated public, we need to get together and learn from each other and talk to each other. So that's huge for me. Okay. I think you didn't ask me, you know, what I have to offer the taxpayers here. I mean, professionally, what I do is I go to companies and I show them ways to improve their efficiency, be more competitive, and uh, more effective. And the government efficiency is a big thing here. We've made great strides over the past decade making our state more efficient. I, I, my specialty is in using computers and data to try and make better decisions and to improve efficiency. I think that there's certainly, uh, we've done a great amount in this state, especially with the uh, Bureau of Motor Vehicles is the most notable example, but there's so much more we could do to make government more efficient, more accessible, and more transparent at the same time by using computers more effectively. Okay, well thank you for that. I'm uh, Again, I'm Doug Ross with Robert Blaskowitz, Assistant Managing Editor, also on our editorial board, Julie Althoff, and Chris Retson, Republican candidates for State Representative in District 19. Thank you for viewing.